This is the 101st episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. First, before we get started with this episode, let's take a second to talk about our great sponsors. Hodgden is the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast. Available in granular powder and pellets, Hodgden's family of 777 powders gives muzzle-loading enthusiasts a quick-cleaning, low-odor, black powder substitute for rifle and pistol applications. To learn more about 777, visit Hodgden.com. Our supporting sponsor is IMR Powder. IMR strives to bring new and legendary powders to reloaders in a never-ending process of innovation. Whether you're reloading for your rifle, pistol, shotgun, or muzzle loader, IMR has a powder to fit your needs. Learn more about this great portfolio of powders at imrpowder.com. Today's show is one I've been waiting for. I had a chance to chat with Mike Doc Baranti. He's a professional custom holster maker who is well known among serious handgun aficionados. Mike has been working on leather since he was a kid, and both his quality and carving work are highly coveted among folks who appreciate fine gun shucks. In today's episode, we talk about how to select a holster, how to care or destroy a holster, and some of his work on custom and historical leather. So, it's time to get strapped and listen to my talk with Doc Barandi. Well, good morning, Doc. Good morning, sir. I appreciate you taking time to talk to us. You are Mike Doc Baranti, famous holster maker. And infamous, infamous. <laughs> infamous holster <Yeah>. maker. <laughs> and I was telling telling you earlier when I've been fishing around for guests for the Guns Magazine podcast, multiple people said, you really got to talk to Doc, really got to talk to Doc. So here <laughs> we are. We finally got it done on the 101st episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. So. Looking forward Those to guys it. guys just want to make fun of me. That's all. That's it. <laughs> well, there's that's that too. It. We're all guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. Well, I, the first question I have to ask is you got to tell the story. Why are you Doc Baranti? Because you're not a medical doctor, right? No, sir. No, sir. No medical training at all. Um, it, it's uh, yeah, funny story. It, it dates back to 1967, uh, April issue of um, Shooting Times Magazine, Skeeter Skelton's article, Hide for Your Handgun. Ah. Skeeter in the article mentions that his holster maker is as important to him as his doctor. Mm. And I, uh, I had met Tank Hoover, one of your writers, back in, uh, let's see, I guess about 2008 or 2009. Um, Tank had contacted me uh, wanting a holster and, and that developed into a friendship. And, and in 2009, my mother had had a stroke and Tank had just gone through similar illness with his mother and passing and all. So he was calling me daily to uh, um, comfort me, you know, keep keep my spirits up and all that sort sure. of thing. And uh, one day I answered the phone and he said, Doc Barani. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, where'd that come from? And he mentioned the article and I knew right off which article he was talking about. We were all Skeeter fans and, and the name stuck. And, ah. uh, it, uh, it, it's funny cause I, I get that a lot through the holster making and all that. I, I met Bart Skelton and Bart said to me one day in one of my visits with him, where'd you get that nickname? <laughs> so then told him the story and his eyes popped up and he said, are you kidding me from my dad? Uh, it, it was, it was funny. <laughs> so tank and doc, it sounds like quite a pair. Yeah. We've had a few adventures and hopefully a few more, uh, before, before the trail's done. Absolutely. And I, I'm remember, didn't you guys, I, uh, published one of his columns here about a year ago. You guys went out to New Mexico and, and poked around, and I think you shot some of Skeeter's guns or something. I, I'm uh, just kind of remembering this off the top of my head. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was quite a highlight, um, meeting Bart and all. We, uh, we got to go visit, and uh, we, we head down to New Mexico once a year to, uh, to Whittington Center, do some shooting down there with a group of guys, and, 
and we made a side trip down to Deming mm-hmm. and, um, and old Bart, he, he welcomed us into his hacienda and, and started pulling out guns from the safe. And oh boy, for, oh my. for a couple of old Skeeter fans, we were in heaven. And, uh, and then a, to our surprise, he says, you want to shoot it? And, you know, <laughs> well, you, you, don't have to ask that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you don't have to ask that question twice. So we ran outside with a box of 44s and, wow. and, uh, you know, the, the DNA that's left in that gun from Skeeter, it, it the gun shot itself. It yeah. was so, so perfect. I mean, we, we both went, uh, you know, almost five for five on a steel plate of 50 yards with, uh, with the gun and, it, it it was just a, a real treat, but yeah. Well, that's, that's one of those, you know, I, I've shot a few historical guns like that and we're all men of a certain age and we've reached a certain level of, you know, you think emotional maturity, but then you're like, I- I'm not going to wash that <laughs> hand anymore. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it just is, you can't even describe what it's like yeah. to handle a gun that you've read about for 30 years. And, um, finally get to touch the thing to let alone shoot it and uh, it just a, a, a quite a highlight quite no, a highlight. no doubt no doubt no well getting down to business you are the boss the head honcho at baranti leather company uh which your logo says since 1890 or 1896 <laughs> you, you sound well for that no 1986 yeah. is what i was trying to yeah. say but you've been right. making holsters a long long time so talk a little bit about sure. how you got started and how you are are this holster guru now oh my gosh i don't know about a guru i'm just a (laughs) shuck maker (laughs) i just make shucks um back it it goes back to being a kid with bb guns and all and um and my mother uh, always had material lying around she was a seamstress and she had some some heavy vinyl from a project she had been working on and and i you know stitched up makeshift holsters out of that for my BB guns. And then <laughs> uh, as I, we didn't, we didn't have guns in the house as a kid. My father was in world war II and he left all his guns in Japan after the war. He, he did uh-huh. not want to bring anything home. Yeah. And um, when he, when he shipped out, he was done with guns and that didn't stop me from falling in love with them. There's, there's pictures and photo albums of me and, and, and diapers with a, with a, cap gun stuff down the front of my cap <laughs> and my diaper. Wow. So it's, you know, it's, uh, they, they, it's something that I've always had a love for. And, um, and I read magazines as I was growing up. I, you know, whenever I had some extra money, I'd go into the grocery store and pick up a shooting times or guns and ammo magazine. And that's when I learned about Skeeter Skelton and Elmer Keith. And, and, um, as I got old enough to buy my own guns, I started with cap and ball revolvers when I was 18 and um, my first real leather holster was just like out of one of Skeeter's articles. It was made from a boot, an old boot top that I had found laying around. (laughs) And, um, and that became my floppy holster for my, for my cap and ball revolver. And then as I graduated from that into center fire and and rim fire, uh, single actions, then uh, that's when I started putting together real leather holsters and um then uh you know early on it, those were what became you know the first baranti leather holsters wow and, uh, yeah and uh, from back then i i made them for other people not as a profession but just as you know for fun until uh i started getting uh, actually halfway good at it and uh, started my little side business but well, you've obviously gotten pretty successful at it. So what is it about building holsters and working with leather that just really seems to to mesh up with your personality? Well, I, I was always into art. And uh, back in high school, I took every drawing class I could and, and uh, working with clay and, and different media. And what I have found with leather, it's a culmination of all of that. You can mold the leather. You can carve it and make it into something that's uh, that's not just pretty to look at but functional and uh, being able to make something that i don't want to give to the customer that's one thing <laughs> you know it's like hey i really like this yeah but um but also uh you know one one thing that i really enjoy doing is recreating holsters that 
are from bygone days. And you know, the, the S.D. Myers gun leather, the Lawrence holsters, the, the stuff that you can't buy anymore. Yeah. That I really feel needs to be remembered and, and carried on um, is what I really enjoy making um, in addition to my own. I was looking on your website and you've got the Baranti Myers line, which is just incredible. Talk a little bit about those. Well, that's one of those things. I, I really like the SD Myers gun leather and uh, they uh, had been made all the way up through the 80s um, and into the 90s, even with uh, Dave Duclos uh, building um, holsters down in Texas um, under the Myers name. and. Once Dave had had his stroke, I, I thought, you know what, this this holster line, the the memory of S. D. Myers, as great as it was, needs to be carried on, and um, and I had already been making various um, models that were similar to his, so I thought, why not incorporate uh, in a certain number of the S. D. Myers line into the Baranti line, and I came up with the Baranti Myers product line and uh that's my registered uh, name and you're still using the same forms and, and some of the stuff what i have is uh, i have the several of the original patterns used by sd myers back in the day these are copper sheet patterns for various guns um you know the colt new service the smith and wesson uh um, well what did they call it back then the triple lock the mm -hmm. uh uh, let's see what else. Chief Special, Detective Special. Um, but these patterns, like I say, they were they were from the original SD Meyer shop, and uh, and I have them now. Probably eight or ten of these patterns that I that I uh, that I use for what I call the legacy line. The legacy line of Barney Myers is holsters that are made using the original patterns. Yeah. As opposed to my interpretation of the patterns, which which many of the holsters are, but Very cool. uh, yeah. And then in addition to that, I have the original maker's mark. So when you order a Baranti Myers holster, you know, it's stamped with Baranti Myers by Doc Baranti, but you also get the stamp used by SD Myers back in the early 1900s. And uh, it, it's something to hold that stamp in your hand, knowing how many craftsmen over the years had used that in mm. addition to S.D. Myers himself. And to have that on a piece of leather that you're sending to a customer, it's just a, a nice touch and, uh, and a way for them to have a little piece of history along with their modern piece of gun leather. Exactly. And and let's get into that gun leather. I visited the shop of uh, Rob Leahy, another well-known holster maker, and I was astounded at the amount of work that goes into a leather holster. I mean, <laughs> sure. it just looks like a piece of leather you slap over and you stitch it up and there you go. And it's significantly more complicated than that. So without getting too far down in the weeds, though, kind of walk through the process of grabbing a big hide off the shelf and turning it into one of these beautiful holsters. Sure. Now, you, of course, you start with the leather, and there are there are two tanneries in the United States, um, I, and I'm fortunate to have one right here in Pennsylvania, uh, Wicked and Craig. They are the oldest tannery in North America. Ah. Um, they they had started in Canada and moved into the United States, and I I'm not sure what uh, what year they came here, but this tannery is about two and a half hours away from me. So I get to go there. I can hand pick my leather if I want, um, or if I just feel like picking it up instead of waiting a couple of days or weeks for them to to uh, ship it to me. I just drive up and visit with my sales guy. Um, but between them and Wicked and Cra I'm sorry, Herman Oak over in uh, St. Louis, that um, they're the only two tanneries in the country, and they make the best leather in the world for making holsters with, hmm. and. We, of course, start with, with a hide from either place. I, I use both. And uh, starting process, you're going to find a nice clean spot on the hide to, uh, to cut your pattern from. So there are various ways to cut patterns out. Some guys use razor knives. I, I have a clicker die, which is a steel cookie cutter, which will punch out a specific holster pattern. Or I have cardboard patterns, and I trace the outline onto the leather. 
and then cut it out using what's called a head knife. The head knife, uh, if you're familiar with the Alaskan Ulu knife, uh, it's just a round blade, um, kind of a uh, half moon, call it. Uh, with, and it's uh, razor sharp. You wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that thing. <laughs> and yeah, you. Uh, I have been, come to think of it, but Ouch. fortunately no stitches. But um, you cut out the leather, then take it to your to your workbench, and uh, first step is all your edge work. Um, some folks, see, you can tell how much work goes into a person's holster by looking at the edges of their holsters. Some it's just raw cut, some it's um, cut and uh, and then an edge die put on. Um, we go through a multiple step sanding process that gives us a, a, a really nice finished edge on the leather. And um, any stamping or carving would be done at this point while the leather is still flat. Some folks, you know, they'll see an in-stock holster and they say, can we have can can you stamp that or put my initials on it? Well, it's a little late at that point. Yeah. You ideally you want your leather lying completely flat on your marble surface for any tooling that gets done. Once that is done, then it's time to start assembly and uh, folding the belt loop down, stitching it in place. Then your uh, your main seam, whether it's a fully welded holster or um, or an unwelded holster, and uh, that's folded stitched finish up your main seam with the same finish process that you did on your other edges and uh, then after that it's the fitting of the holster to the particular gun and we do that by wetting the holster and then inserting either the actual firearm or a dummy gun and i have a couple different styles of dummy guns some of them are plastic and some are uh, cast aluminum and they're they're all made from from original guns so it's not a it's not a toy gun it's it's made from an actual firearm and um, so they're as detailed as as the real thing and once the gun has been fitted then a drying process i use uh, i i put my holsters in front of a heater to uh, to dry them out and then once they are completely dry um, they're ready for final finish which is uh, i use a Neat's foot oil mixture that I coat all my holsters with, and depending on the leather, it may take one or two coats of uh, of this oil mixture to uh, finish the holster, and then then it's ready for photography, and then off to the customer. Well, I'm sitting here looking at the leather gallery on your website, and I've got a thousand more questions. But let's let's go back to what's a welded seam versus an un unwelded seam. I'm not familiar. Okay, uh, and the it's welt, um, W-E-L-T. Oh, okay. And, and the welt is an extra strip of leather that's sewn in between the two pieces, the front and back of the holster, uh -huh. and it does a couple things. It makes for a slimmer fit to the actual gun, and it also um, it'll add rigidity to the to the uh, holster body itself, and it aids in gun retention based on how you build it. Um, you can have a welt sewn in but if it doesn't press up against the uh, the lower portion of the frame or the trigger guard then um, it's not aiding in the uh, retention process but uh, like the old uh, tom three person style holster it had a full length welt and that welt actually pressed against the frame of the firearm which aids in uh, keeping it in uh, keeping the gun in the holster yeah and then the unwelted style was just as you fold the holster over to form the pocket for the pistol, you just put the front and back together and then sew it together. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at your leather art gallery, as I said, and I am stunned at the work here. I mean, some of it looks like almost a, a photographic process. How in the world? I mean, it, it's as good as any sculpture I've seen, and it's done on leather. I'm just amazed. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's a lot of fun. I enjoy uh, the the end result, and uh, and I hope my customers like it. Well, I got to say, there's a bourbon bottle sleeve here that I'm I'm really fancying. We we may have to commission a piece after we oh, get absolutely. done talking. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, that uh, that was. Uh, you see, it's a it's a jug of uh, Henry McKenna. Yeah, which which was Skeeter's favorite drink. Ah, and, okay. 
So uh, it was for a raffle. And, and actually, we ended up auctioning off that thing uh, rather than raffling it. Um, so I thought, hey, it's it's a bottle of Henry McKenna. It's got to have Skeeter Skelton on it. Yeah. So it's it's an image, the famous in, image of Skeeter Skelton sitting holding his uh, seven and a half inch flat top. Yeah. And, um, and I carved that on and, and uh, we ended up uh, raffling for, I'm um, sorry, auctioning that off for, for, I think it went for $500. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the bottle and the and the sleeve, yeah. Well, I got to say, I mean, looking at some of these others, I see our, our uh, good friend John Taffin's in there. Uh, oh, yeah. I see Ronald Reagan um, and a lot of. <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing the work you're doing here, and and that's Thank just you. done with the the tapping and the tools at the bench. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a, you take a pattern and trace it onto the leather uh, while it's damp, so it leaves a slight impression of whatever outline you put on there and so we do any kind of carving on the leather um if if you want to repeat a particular carving style you'll have master templates on, done on a thin film which is what i use for all my holsters so that uh, the carving style is the same on each one and uh, and similar process done with photographs such as the the reagan and, and taffin yeah uh, carving and uh yeah just it's it's just basic leather work that's all <laughs> yeah right whatever <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into what is probably the most important question about what we're talking about is the care and feeding of a good holster and sure. i've been as guilty as anybody else of uh probably not taking care of them like i should and and i we've all seen old shucks that are pretty much deteriorated to the point of they're not work you know not workable anymore but what how should you be caring for your your gun leather well, when I, as I stated before, part of my uh, holster making process is, you know, when you when you build a holster, it gets wet, and in that process, some of the the oils that are in the leather from the tannery they leach out, and in the drying process, the holster loses that oil, which is essential to keeping the the, the holster alive. So I add that back in in my finish process, and as I send them out, um, they're ready for use, ready to take out in the field, carry concealed, whatever. And depending on how hard you use your leather, if, uh, unless you're going swimming with it or whatever, you um, you really don't have to do anything probably for a couple years unless your leather gets either really wet, really dirty, um, you know covered in dust from from working cattle whatever um, at that point i would say get as much of the dirt and crud off as you can i don't think that i would tell somebody to use neat foot oil I'm, I'm sorry not neat foot oil uh, uh, saddle soap on on their gun leather ah. unless it's really really bad you know if you've rolled around in the mud or whatever and you got to get that stuff off then okay you can clean it either using a glycerin saddle soap or I had an old saddle maker tell me um, he uses uh, liquid disc detergent to clean his saddles. Oh, really? He just, yeah. Um, it's not harmful. It gets the crud out, and then you can re-oil uh, the leather with a holster because you need it to retain a certain amount of rigidity. You don't want to keep adding neat's foot oil. Uh -huh. It's part it's part of my initial process, but unless you're real familiar with it, you can overdo it, and you don't want to overdo a good holster because it'll just turn into a soggy mess, and then it, it'll never recover from being oiled too much. Oh, really? So yeah, you um, there there are several other products that are out there that I recommend to my customers, and I use them in the shop as well. One is Lexol. Um, Lexol can tend to leave a kind of a, a white film on the leather, so I don't use it that much, depending on what what I would would use it on. Smooth leather, maybe, but not a, it's not something carved, um, just because it'll get down in the into the carving details, and and you'd have a heck of a time getting it out. Yeah. Um, but Black Rock is a product. Black Le Black Rock Leather Enrich. 
that's the one I recommend the most to people. I use it in my shop. Sometimes I'll use it on a holster before I send it out just because, you know, once I, once I've done my oiling and buffing on the holster, it, it just depends on the hide. Sometimes I'll add that just because it, it adds a little something to the finish that I feel the holster needs. Um, but as a care product for a customer, I'd say, yeah, get yourself some black rock and, same deal with that as with with any other product. A little goes a long way, and you don't <laughs> want to overdo it. So you just use your fingertips and rub it in. Then you wipe off the excess, buff a little, and you're ready to go. Ah, well, we are guys, and we are Americans. So if a little's good, a whole lot more's <laughs> got to be better, be right? Better. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you go ahead and do that, and you can order another holster <laughs> when <laughs> there it doesn't you go. work anymore. <laughs> Yeah. So would you say overall most leather holsters get killed by too much love and tenderness and care or not enough? Uh, well, th it depends. Now, you, you look at if you order a, an old vintage holster off of um, eBay, I, I'll do that. I, I, I scour eBay every couple of days and look for old Lawrence or S.D. Myers holsters that I might want to add to my collection. And um, I've gotten a few that were so dry that you know they've never had anything done to them since they left the factory you know, 50 60 years ago yeah and depending on the climate and how much use they saw either the holster is shot where it's you know if if you flex the leather a little bit it, it'll crack immediately mm -hmm. or um but it, or it'll just break. <laughs> it'll take a chunk of leather <laughs> off whenever it, whenever you, you bend it. Um, and other stuff I've gotten has been really soggy. So you know they dunked it in oil or just <laughs> oiled repeatedly trying to bring resurrect the thing. Now recently I got to see Elmer Keith's number five and his Lawrence holster that he carried that gun in for thirty years. That holster was as perfect a condition a holster as i've ever seen for, wow. for as old as it was so he knew how to take care of his stuff and he used neat foot oil but in he he knew not to make things soggy yeah. and um it it just was really well cared for of course he lived up in in idaho so it was a dry climate as opposed to being you know in a coastal uh, region um I've handled some coastal leather and do scary just because <laughs> of the, the moisture content, the salty air, whatever gets into the leather. And it's, it's very hard on, on the leather, but for where El Elmer lived, it was a perfect, uh, well, he was up in the Northwest at, initially, I guess. Yeah. But that, uh, that holster was in really, really good condition for as old as it was. Do you ever get uh, holsters back? Uh, with interesting stories, people saying, well, bear chewed on this. Can you fix it? Or you ever get any, anything like that in the door? Uh, no. Um, no, I really haven't. I really haven't. Maybe someday I'll get a good story out of one of my yeah. pieces of leather. I, I know a lot of my leather gets used, but I also know a lot of it just sits on a shelf. And um, nothing makes me happier than to, uh, to hear from a customer that they're out using their holster on a daily basis. Um, yeah. Well, this is one of those questions that it's like asking you which of your kids is your favorite, and you may have mm -hmm. one, but you don't want to say, but do you have a favorite piece or a favorite style, or uh, do you love all of them equally? Gosh, I, I really enjoy making the um, the old S.D. Meyer styles. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I have my own holster designs that I'm, I'm very happy with the designs I've come up with on my own. And um, if I had to pick a favorite, I'd probably lean towards some of the older stuff mm -hmm. just just because it's it's a treat to recreate them. Yeah. Um, if, if the question was, what was the best rig you ever made? <laughs> then I I would say the next one. Ah. Yeah. So, well, you beat me to the question because I was going to ask. Were you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know there are some very special rigs out there that, that I made that I'm extremely proud of. Um, and actually, more than one, I've made several rigs for a Texas Ranger, and he uses them on duty. And oh, very that cool. 
Yeah, that that was a real treat. Um, his his first rig was bought for him by his father. His father contacted me and wanted a special rig. His son was just about to be commissioned as a Texas Ranger, and he wanted him uh, to have a nice rig. And then once the fella got it, he contacted me for another rig uh, in a different color. So wow. he's got his summer and, and winter rig that uh, that he wears um, on a daily basis, which is quite a thrill. No doubt. No doubt. Well, if folks are looking for a holster, of course, we want them to buy from the Baranti Leather Company. But just in general, when folks are shopping for gun leather, what are some of the things they need to be thinking about? One thing that's going to happen, pe- people think right off the bat that they're going to order a holster and it's going to be the only holster that they use for the rest of their life. <laughs> and as, Guilty. <laughs> you're you're laughing at that because yeah. you know the you know what the real story is. You've got a box full of holsters. Exactly. <laughs> You buy a holster, you use it, and then you think, oh, this one, I wish I had one that did this just a little bit different. So you find another holster, and then the first one goes in the box. And by the end of your life, you've got three or four big old plastic crates filled with <laughs> with all your gun leather. and Like and the one in my closet, five feet exactly. away from where I'm sitting. Sure. And that, that's one thing people have to realize, you know, they... they uh, they're they're going to need to try different types of holsters until they find one that they like the best, and um, that could be a it could be an inside the waistband holster, you know, mm-hmm. which might surprise people. But I sell a ton of inside the waistband holsters, and what'll really make you laugh is what they're for. They're for single action revolvers. Really, there are guys whose only gun would be you know they're they're ruger or their colt single action revolver yeah. that it's their gun that they take hunting and and they want to they they are familiar with that gun they don't want to learn how to shoot a double action revolver or one of those plastic guns or whatever they like their single action so they yeah. want a holster to carry it in and i sell them all day long huh. um, for single action revolvers and um that wouldn't be my choice, and I wouldn't recommend it, but I am completely in awe of guys that are that old school. Uh, sure. You know, that that's and pretty there, neat. And there's a lot of them, and, uh, and that, that's, uh, that's, that's one way of carrying them. Um, I have another customer who, who loves his single actions. He's an older fella. It's what he shoots daily. So he's very comfortable and, and very... Um, skilled in, at using his gun so that's his daily carry gun he carries outside the waistband and um, he uses a couple different versions of my holsters uh, on a daily basis he's got his sunday go to meeting <laughs> fancy outfit that he wears and then for the rest of the week his plain holster and um, like i said it's if if it's what you know and you're good with it and you're comfortable with it there's there's nothing wrong with the uh, with a 44 or 45 caliber five or six shot revolver as, as your daily carry, if that's, uh, if that's what makes you feel good. Well, exactly. And I've said it countless years, the old saw about beware the man with one gun because he can probably use it. That is absolutely true. And, and if absolutely. a guy, you know, it's pretty much a gun is an extension of their arm, then they're probably going to be pretty good when the chips are down. Exactly. Exactly. And getting back to your question, um, one thing that I'll ask people will say, hey, I need a I need a holster for this gun. What do you recommend? And well, that's really broad. Yeah. And I I follow that up with a question. You need to tell me what you want to do with it. Are you wanting to conceal that gun? Are you just taking it to the range? Is this going to be your daily carry? Are you going to conceal it under a jacket? If so, you know you need to know if they want to carry a, a five and a half inch barreled gun. They better either have a frock coat on or <laughs> yeah, yeah. come up with something else. You get got to you got to work with me a little bit yeah. here on this. Yeah, but um, but that that's one of the things they need to they need to think about what their intention is with this gun. Is it something that they want? to hunt with or is it for personal protection and then then we'll 
delve a little deeper into, okay, for concealed carry, I'm going to recommend this, this holster. If, we, if we're talking range or hunting, then it's going to be a different style of holster. So there, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked of the person as to what their, what their real intention is. Uh, yeah. You know, one question that I usually ask folks that build custom gear, whether it's guns, leather, whatever, and about, I don't know, 50, 50 to 60% of them will have a story. Has anybody ever asked you to do something? You're like, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to tackle that. Somebody else might, but I'm not going to do it. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, you a, a Joe money. Biden, you know, face on a holster or anything <laughs> like that. Yeah. I've not gotten that yet. <laughs> yet. It, we're only not even a year into this administration. So maybe, <laughs> maybe in another year or two, if yeah. you're still president, we'll, we'll hear. <laughs> this. But, um, yeah, I've, I've gotten a few where I've just had to say to the person, I'm sorry, that's, that's not something I'm really willing to make. Yeah. And I, I can't think of it off the top of my head for, for every customer that looks at the catalog and says, okay, this is the holster I want. There, there's maybe one in a hundred that will say, I want this and this and this put together into one holster. You know, they, they have their own concept of what they think is going to be the ideal holster for themselves. And at that point, it's almost like, well, maybe you should take a trip to Tandy Leather and, <laughs> and learn how to sew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Get some leather, get a few, you know, there's books there you can look at. Um, but saying that. I do like a challenge and I've had people come to me and say, okay, here's what I need, doc. I want to conceal an end frame speed loader. Mm -hmm. You know, the typical speed loader pouch carries a big bulky uh, uh, speed loader on the outside of your belt. So it's a big lump sticking out mm -hmm. and they wanted something that was concealable. And I had one that I thought was fairly concealable design that I came up with a few years ago and, and it worked. Um, but it did tip out away from the body some. So I put my thinking cap on and, and I actually came up with a speed loader holder that uh, is concealable. Oh. And, uh, it, it straddles the belt and pulls the, the entire speed loader into your body as opposed to letting it lean out. It's secure and, uh, and it, it's very functional. I call it the Baranti spare and it, uh, it's it's a good piece of kit for your for your carry gear. Um, Very cool. Uh, yeah. Well, then my next obvious follow on question then is, what haven't you done? Is there anything that you still, you know, if the the stars all line up the right way, that I, I want to do this someday? Mm, well, there will be at least one Baranti saddle out there. Ah. That will be someday before I die. I want to make a saddle just because I think the saddles are, well, besides being cool, it's it's the ultimate for a leather worker and and your skill level and it, depending on what kind of finish you do on it, you know, I'll, I'll probably carve the whole thing. So mm -hmm. being mirror images on each side, uh, there's a lot of carving and and also it'll it'll be a masterpiece <laughs> at least if. If I do it right, it'll be it'll be something worth worth having. But um, but that's that's what I want to do down the road someday. Well, I would love to see that, and and you said it masterpiece. It certainly would. Uh, looking at your your other work with holsters. So if folks are interested in looking at your stuff and hopefully buying your stuff, how do they learn more about Baranti Leather? Oh gosh, well you can always go right on the internet to www.barantileather.com. And take a look. Uh, stuff that's not on there, feel free to email me. You can contact me through the website, and uh, we can discuss any kind of project. Um, I've done boxes and pouches and things that aren't on that website and, and aren't listed as a product that I make. So pretty much anything that can be done with leather, I'm, I'm willing to at least uh, entertain the thought of it. So. Um, it's uh, it's always worth a try to ask. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, Doc, thank you for taking time and educating me and our listeners on on leather and your leather. And I'm telling you, folks need to go to brandyleather.com and, and look at some of these, especially the leather gallery. I am I knew you did good work, but until I was sitting here talking to you and looking at these pictures, <laughs> I'm amazed. It's it's crazy good stuff. So thanks. And we will hook up somewhere down the trail. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thank you, Brent. I learned a lot from Doc Baranti, and I'm now itching to have one of his custom holsters on my own hip. And with that, I sincerely hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first on the newsstand, and today we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and of course, at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available on our websites. I'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And please don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, Hodgden Powder. And, of course, our supporting sponsor, IMR Powder. See their complete lineup of great black and smokeless powders at Hodgden.com or IMRPowder.com. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting.